Good morning, good evening, wherever you are across the world and the universe. Welcome to my Quantum Living podcast at the intersection of science and spirituality. I'm your host, Anna Anderson, quantum teacher, intuitive guide, and above all, an inquisitive soul. This podcast is about how we can bring the various spiritual, metaphysical, and esoteric concepts and ideas validated by quantum physics and modern cosmology to the very practical level to improve and enrich our life experience as individuals, communities, and the humankind. Whether you are listening to this show while driving or commuting, doing chores around the house, relaxing on a couch, or flying in a spaceship across the galaxy, I hope you'll enjoy today's episode. Okay, let's begin. Hello and welcome back to Quantum Living. Spirit communication has been an integral part of human life since the beginning of our civilization. People have been receiving information and guidance from the spirit directly, which we now call intuition, insight and channeling, or via an intermediary, someone able to receive messages from the other side and pass them on to the loved ones, a process we call mediumship. Why do we want to communicate with those in spirit? Why do we seek information and guidance or just a connection. Love is not bound by space or time, but our human love is anchored in this 3D reality and linked to the person or pet we love because that's all we know. The physicality of our relationships is very strong. We want to hold, touch, and embrace those we love. We want to be close to them, and the only way we know how is to have them physically in our life. We want to look into their eyes and want to see their smile. The pain of separation can be unbearable. Those in the armed forces serving at sea or in another country for several months at a time can attest to that. Virtual relationships don't work. We need to be physically close to those we love. We need to have them in our life. So when our loved one dies, when we lose our child, partner, sibling, parent, or a friend, knowing that we will not see them or be able to hold them ever again, is probably the most grueling human experience we can have. We often feel as if we have died inside. There is nothing we can do about it. We are just wired in this way. Grieving is a process where we must learn how to let them go. How to come to terms with not having them in our life anymore in the same way. It is the process of adjusting our energetic connection with them by removing the physical attachment of love. I said adjusting as our connection never dies. The truth is, we never die. Yet it is one thing to understand and accept this concept intellectually or even spiritually, and another to reach out for it when we are drowning in the sea of pain and silent tears, inconsolable, staring into the black hole that has suddenly appeared in our life, in our heart and our aura, at a loss as to what we are supposed to do with it. How can we keep on living? Grief is the price we pay for love. Queen Elizabeth II famously said after the passing of her husband, which beautifully encapsulates the essence of our humanity. Grief is the price we pay for love. The true spiritual nature of our soul is exactly the same, doesn't change, no matter through which religious lens you look at it. And this truth will help us heal and move through the grief with less pain and suffering if we just allow ourselves to open up to it. When we cross over to the other side, we do just that. We cross over. We don't ever die. Death does not exist in the creation. Energy can't be destroyed. It can only change form. 
and so we change our form as we move through the dimensions of different frequencies over and over again, from the physical 3D to the fourth and fifth dimension and beyond. We don't need our physical body in the higher dimensions or planes of existence, and so we leave it behind at the exit point we chose to take. While most people believe in the afterlife of some sort, where our soul goes after death of the physical body, not many accept that the personality, memories, and all information about the person played by the soul in this incarnation is retained by its energy on the other side. While communication through the veil is not easy due to the difference between the two frequencies, when it does take place via a medium and the spirit of our departed loved one comes forward, they are the essence, the energy of the person they lived, your mother, your father or your child. There is no break in the continuum of your experience together. We seek reassurance that they are okay, and they are usually happy to confirm this. But when we ask them, so tell me all about the afterlife, and what do you do over there? The most common answer is, you wouldn't understand. And that's true. While they can't satisfy our curiosity, we don't really need to understand. All we want to hear is that they are fine, they love us, and often help us and protect us. It is not uncommon for them to give us some guidance, information about the location of the will or other important objects they left behind, an instruction to seek medical help, or even a warning about a future event we should avoid. It can be anything, really. This connection helps us heal our broken heart, giving comfort that they are okay. It also helps them on their soul journey. The flow of love never stops, so let's tune in to the loving guidance from the other side. Okay, now it's the time to introduce to you my special and returning guest, Mark Anthony. Mark Anthony, JD, Psychic Explorer, also known as the Psychic Lawyer, is a world-renowned fourth-generation psychic medium, near-death experiencer, and Oxford-educated attorney. He has received many accolades for his work over the years, including the most recent Best Holistic Life Award for Inspirational Book of the Year 2023. That's for his book, The Afterlife Frequency, we talked about in the last episode. You will find more information about Mark in his guest profile on my podcast website at quantumlivingpodcast.com. And of course, you will find there the show notes for this episode. My first interview with Mark, The Frequency of the Afterlife, was published in two parts in April this year, so if you haven't listened to it yet, you will find it in Season 4 on my website. Hello Mark, welcome to Quantum Living, good to have you back on my show. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you Anna for having me on. Lovely. Congratulations on your most recent award, by the way, your book award. Well, actually, it's won three awards. It won the Cover Visionary Award for Best Book in Reincarnation, Death, and Grieving. Then it won the Best Holistic Life um, Award for Most Inspirational Book. And then recently, it won the OMI Award, uh, which is sponsored by OM Times and iSpirit Media as Metaphysical Book of the Year. And then I understand pretty progressive, um, designated as one of the top books about faith in God. So it's it's been amazing how well received my book, The Afterlife Frequency, has has been um, all over the globe. And I'm really excited being back here on your show because we had such a great conversation last time, and I really love the new format uh, for this show. So um, this is this is really an honor to be here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's a, such a great pleasure to have you back. And uh, wow, yes, I've read the book and I'm not surprised that it has won so many awards. 
And I do recommend it to everyone interested in this topic or even to people who may not be familiar with it, just to find out more information. And the link to the book on Amazon is in the show notes for the previous episode, and I will also include it for this one. Our previous interview was quite comprehensive, to to say the least. So today, I'd like to focus more specifically on the guidance we receive from the other side. Once we have accepted that, yes, we can communicate with our departed loved ones and pretty much any soul we have some connection with who has crossed over as we never really die, we do want to know and understand more about the afterlife. A friend of mine whose husband died of a sudden heart attack told me that not long after his passing, he came to her in a vivid dream as she was devastated by his death. After he reassured her that he was fine, my friend said, okay, okay, so that's great. Now tell me all about the afterlife. I mean, what is it? How does it work? What do you do over there? (laughs) She had so many questions, but he just replied very calmly, you wouldn't understand. And she said, you know, when I woke up, I was so frustrated with such a flipping and dismissing un- dismissive answer. <laughs> what did he mean I wouldn't understand? I, I can't understand everything. So probably I suspect that if she didn't wake up at that point, she might have had an argument with him like they often did <laughs> during their marriage about you know, not answering questions. Yeah. But there is a bit more profound aspect to it. So I'm curious, is spirit communication a one or two-way street, and do we have the right, if I can put it this way, to be frustrated or or maybe even offended by the spirit's lack of cooperation if they choose not to give us the answers we are seeking, and conversely, why would they want to give us specific advice or more information beyond confirming that they are okay? First off, I found it very interesting that the spirit of your husband, uh, your friend's husband, said, uh, you know, when when asked, what do we do over here? And the response was, you wouldn't understand. In the thousands of readings I've done as a medium, it's very popular for people to ask, what do they do? And almost always they respond with, you wouldn't understand. Now, they're not being condescending and they're not trying to be frustrating. They are immortal living beings that are pure energy. And in the afterlife frequency, my latest book, I introduced the term the electromagnetic soul, which we discussed extensively on your last uh, program. But electromagnetic soul, for the benefit of people who don't understand, that's a 21st century term to describe what we really are, which is pure consciousness, a soul, a spirit, that is eternal electromagnetic energy. Because the brain does not create the soul. The brain does not create consciousness. It merely hosts it the way that a computer hard drive hosts the programs on it. Now, I'm giving a very abbreviated explanation of the the EMS, electromagnetic soul. So think of your soul as a drop of water. And then when we physically die, that drop of water leaves the hard drive slash Mm -hmm. brain and then plunges into the eternal sea of consciousness the eternal sea of souls that I refer to as the collective consciousness. So what happens is our brain, which hosts the the soul, is, is a very complex computing organ in our body. And it is designed for finite perception. So when we leave the body, we transition we, meaning our EMS, our electromagnetic soul, transitions from finite perceptive capabilities to the infinite. And you and I and everybody listening cannot possibly comprehend infinity because everything that we know has limitations. We're born, we grow old, we die. Everything we know has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And for whatever reason we're in this material world to have these finite experiences. And Mm -hmm. so then once you revert to an infinite being, how could we possibly understand 
what it's like, number one, to be pure energy. Number two, not only to be pure energy, but to move at the speed of light. Number three, to be a multidimensional being that can essentially be in different places at the same time. And number four, have access to information that far exceeds anything we can even comprehend. Um, I think Albert Einstein kind of described this the best. He said, when trying to understand the universe and infinity, think of a four-year-old who walks into a library and the four-year-old child sees all the books in the library and knows that there's things in the books, there's words in the books and knows that people wrote the books, but doesn't understand anything in the books. We're the four-year-old. So what drives the spirit, if I can put it this way, to either simply confirm that they are okay, if they are our loved ones, Mm -hmm. or to give us some additional information or or indeed advice that they feel that they want to give us for whatever reason. And some do that, but not the others. So how, how does it work? What are the drivers of the conversation. Well, if I can, let me back up again, because your last set of questions, you said, is spirit communication a two-way street? Mm -hmm. Let me answer that. And then I want to get to your question, uh, your most recent questions. Frequency beacons, that's what I call um, the two-way street of spirit communication. So think of everyone that you know, both in this world and in spirit, as being interconnected with this three-dimensional spider web. And how does the spider web work? It works on vibration, vibration and frequency. Something hits the spider web, it sends a, um, a vibration to the spider and which alerts the spider that there's something there. It's the same thing with spirit communication. Let's say that you're grieving a loved one very deeply and you're, or you're, you're thinking about somebody who's passed very deeply and you're emitting this electromagnetic frequency the spirit picks up on it and it draws him or her or a group of them to you. Conversely, if a spirit wants to get your attention, they will send a a vibrational impulse along this frequency beacon. For example, let's say you're, you're sitting there and suddenly you feel compelled to turn on the radio and voila, there is that song that touches your heartstrings that makes you think of your loved one. You think that is just a fluke. Or let's say you start to smell like your mother's cologne, your mother's perfume, or another scent associated with somebody who passed, and there's no source for that. So there, Or you start seeing weird electrical anomalies, like you start getting messages on your phone from somebody who's passed, or, or when you start thinking about someone you love, the bathroom light starts to flicker. Um, these are all forms of frequency beacons and spirits being electromagnetic energy, they can influence with EM fields and they can also make us uh, smell things um, because it's our brain that controls us. Our brain operates on uh, electrical impulses. So there's the two-way street of of, um, spirit communication. Now, the next part of your question is sometimes they give us advice and sometimes they don't. Uh, in the, the thousands of readings that I've done, I've had many spirits come through and give people advice, and they try to to direct them. You see, you know that it's a message from, from a spirit when it's about love, healing, resolution, and protection. Um, let, me, let me go on a tangent for a bit. I get really annoyed with the media when they talk about these terrorists with their spiritual advisors. Okay, these are not spiritual advisors, they're religious fanatics who are warping the Quran, warping the Bible, warping various religious texts to fit into a political agenda. There's nothing spiritual about that, there's nothing involving God about that, that is pure human ego edging God out, okay? So if somebody goes, oh, Allah has told me to put on this bomb vest and blow up a market and kill all these people— Newsflash, Allah did not tell anyone to do that. A religious fanatic or a political extremist is hijacking faith in God to justify one's more one's 
ego-driven political agenda of anger, bigotry, hatred, and violence. Nothing that comes from the spiritual is about that. Messages from the divine, messages from Allah, God, Rama, Yahweh, uh, Jehovah, Shiva, Vishnu are never, and, and I use all those different names for God because we're all talking about the same energy. We're all talking about the energy of the divine power, and none of that is about destruction and hatred. Okay, people are all about destruction and hatred and anger. Just read our history, <laughs> okay? Um, so, so when a spirit, which is interconnected with the collective consciousness, that is is part of the divine that we we call God, they can give us advice and try to maneuver us away from something. Um, I remember I was doing a gallery reading. There was about 100 people there, and I was drawn to this woman, and she and her teenage daughter stood up, and the woman's father came through, who was the young lady's grandfather, and all of a sudden, the focus of the messages was on the granddaughter. And he said, don't go to the concert. I go, don't go to the concert. That just flew right out of my mouth. And the young girl goes, but I'm supposed to go to this Taylor Swift concert in a week. And she was getting all bent out of shape. And the mother's like, well, maybe she shouldn't go. You know, okay. Well, a year later, Anna, I was doing another event. And when it was over, this woman and her daughter walked up. She goes, I don't know if you remember us, but a year ago, you, you said um, my, my father told my daughter not to go to the concert. And I vaguely remembered it because, I mean, I, I'm, I'm on tour every couple of weeks. I do thousands of readings. But when they started telling me, I go, oh, I remember that. And they said, you won't believe this. So the young girl said, so I called my friends and she called my, she goes, I called my friends and said, I'm not going to the concert. And they go, why? Well, the psychic said that I shouldn't go to the concert. Um, and, and I think something may happen. So the young ladies, there was three other um, young ladies, they were driving on an interstate highway to go to the concert. And they'd heard this message from me and they were so freaked out. And on the way, all of a sudden they got four blowouts, four flat tires, and they were stranded on, and luckily they were, they were really scared when, you know, they were going slow. And uh, when the police and the, uh, um, the tow truck arrived, they said that there was something all over the highway. Uh, something must have fallen off a truck. It looked like a bunch of nails were all over the highway. And the trooper, uh, the police officer the, uh, said, why were you going so slow? And they said that. And he goes, well, thank God you were, because if you'd been going 30 or 40 miles faster, you probably would have flipped. You guys could have all been killed. Now, the grandfather spirit came through, gave advice. You're not. To, and, and I remember he said, you're not to go to the concert. You're not to get in that car. That's what the message was. You're not to go to the concert. You're not to get in that car. And so the the young lady and her mother discussed this, and she decided she shouldn't go. But what was really beautiful about the message is she told her friends, so the grandfather's guidance extended to these three other girls. Once again, messages from the divine are about love, healing, resolution, and protection. So this grandfather not only saved his own granddaughter, but through her was able to save, potentially save three other lives. And I remember when I heard that, I mean, yeah, I can understand getting one flat tire, but all four tires. And but but the police were saying there were, were nails on they had to close down the interstate and 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 just clean off the road because they said, you know, this this was so dangerous. Now, when when people say, Oh, you're cold reading, and it, it, really, come on. Come on, when something like that happens, um, I mean, I have several messages, um, um, health messages. That's a very big component of spirit communication. Spirits will come through because healing is a gift from God. Healing is a gift, you know, from the divine. And um, I was doing a session and there was this husband and wife and they were older and the, the spirits suddenly targeted the husband and said, get him into a cardiologist right away. And they're looking at me, and, and I said, I'm feeling a heart attack. He goes, well, I feel fine. I said, look, make an appointment. 
Well, a couple months later, I was back at that venue and th this man walked up to me and said, can I shake your hand? And I said, why? He goes, you saved my life. He said, do you remember? And that was that man and, and his wife. And he um, uh, she said, you're going to cardiologist. And they they went there and the, the cardiologist said, oh, my God, you're on the verge of a major heart attack. But because they caught it before it happened, they were able to treat it with statins and blood thinners. And uh, he may have had a catheterization. So, I mean, I could go on and on and on. I have uh, so many examples. But as you can see, spirits will intervene. The question is, are we listening? And certainly when it comes through a medium like myself, it can be very direct. But for people who are not mediums, let's say, um, Anna, that you have a, a dream where a loved one tells you, you know, watch out for this or or go get this tested, or if somebody has this intuitive feeling that, you know, um, my child might be in danger or, or you know, my spouse needs to go to the doctor, you've got to listen to this. So they are giving us messages. The question is, are we listening? Yes, beautiful. Thank you. And by the way, I love your metaphor of the spider web. This is a very, very nice illustration of how this works. Now, is spirit communication with us a completely selfless service or do they have an agenda? Do they benefit somehow from helping us, for example, as a mission fulfilled progressing them on their own soul journey or not? I don't know if anyone has the answer to that question. Um, I don't have all the answers. I have insights based in, in my contact with the other side. And I always get a kick out of these mediums that say, oh, I know what it is. It's like, no, you don't. You have insights. Um, and, and but, but love. The motivation is love. Mm -hmm. From what I have seen, there's a day we're going to be born into this world, and there's a day that we're coming out, and those two dates are fixed. What we have choice over is what we do in between. So let's say your choices have been eating the worst foods possible. You're eating every type of red meat, fried food, sugar, all the fun stuff, okay? You're eating all the garbage and it's building up plaque in your heart and plaque in your brain. So you are priming yourself for either a massive heart attack or a stroke. Now, you're still going to die on the day that's designated, but if a spirit comes through and says, you need to clean up your act, start eating healthily and get some exercise. The question is, do you want the last 15 years of your life to be where you're self-sufficient, robust, and able to get around or paralyzed because of a massive stroke? So so there is a spirit coming in to, to tell you what to do. Now, why are they doing that? Love, they love you. You love them, they love you. Now, the next part of your question, does it help in their... Does it help them? I think it does, because I remember uh, uh, several spirits I've communicated with, because the question always is, well, what are they doing? What's their job? And, and and I get that response. You can't understand it. And I remember a couple of times I've said, look, you always tell me that. Come on, try me. They said it's about growth and evolution and elevation of our our, our vibration. So I interpret that to mean that when they act as guidance for love, healing, resolution, protection, that it does benefit them. But on the other hand, when you do something for someone you love and, and it's a positive thing, isn't that reward enough? Yes. Yes, I've, I I have to agree with you. Although, as you have mentioned, there are many views and opinions and schools of thought about it in the spiritual community about helping about us helping the spirit 
souls or the souls in spirit to evolve and progress and you know as we might put it in in our colloquial terms earn their points if you like <laughs> Uh, on their soul journey. But ultimately, I, I have to agree with you that it is about unconditional love. And even even from the souls that we have no blood connection with or no family connection or even someone completely remote to us. Now, do souls in spirit ever lie? Have you ever caught someone on the other side making up things or being mischievous? <laughs> that that has never been my experience. And I do know that there are uh, mediums who will disagree with me. And recently I filmed an episode for an upcoming television show, a new TV show that will be on the Discovery Channel. So it will be worldwide. And I can't divulge um, the details of that. But um, the, the one of the aspects during the paranormal investigation that we're doing at the site of the, these heinous crimes, just absolutely horrible things, was, you know, can a, can a negative spirit uh, drive somebody to descend into the madness of homicide? And I don't I don't subscribe to that theory. Um, I think that um, an unbalanced mind is going to do some negative things anyway, but I have never encountered a spirit whose intent was to deceive. I've had some of my colleagues say, well, I've encountered that. Um, and then another colleague of mine said, well, maybe you're just dealing with higher frequencies and spirits for the highest of purposes. And when before I do any reading, any communication, I pray, I meditate, and I ask God to send forth spirits for the highest of purposes to bring us messages of love, healing, and resolution. So I don't believe that spirits come through and lie to you, but if there are ones who do, I am absolutely not interested in, in communicating with them, and they are not welcome in any connections that I do. And um, because it is the medium who sets the parameters, defines the parameters of the contact and the conduct. And I've always had amazingly beautiful, loving spirits coming through to help people. Okay, that's good to hear because yeah, I've heard from a few people uh, those questions. Well, can I rely on what the spirit has said? Uh, you know, were they lying? Were they mischievous? Or is it possible even that they may have got the wrong information as it well. I mean, if anyone knows anything about you more than you do, that would be someone existing in, you know, what we call the other side of the, or the afterlife. Apart from communication via a medium, one of the most common ways to receive guidance from the souls in spirit is in a dream, like in my friend's case, for example. Many years ago, I had two very vivid and very unusual dreams, both of which were in the same location, although months apart. And I know that they were actual spirit connections or communication. In my first dream, I was walking with my grandfather through a beautiful large garden, which was in the old English style with widening pathways and flower beds. And we were talking or rather, my grandpa was talking and I was listening very attentively. I knew that he was telling me something very important. When I woke up, I didn't remember what he said, but I knew that that was recorded or registered, if you like, in my unconscious mind. Then, several months later, I had an almost identical dream in the same garden, but this time... I was walking with and listening attentively with my head down to Pope John Paul II, cool. who was in spirit at the time. And again, he was uh, giving me some very important and profound messages, which I didn't remember again when I woke up, but I knew that his guidance was registered by my soul and it was something really, really important. Could you please speak to spirit communication in a dream. Oh, I've got um, <laughs> a lot to say about that. that. Would take a lot longer than than we've got. Um, Shorter version. <laughs> short version. Um, there is a brainwave frequency that occurs when we're sleeping, which is 
around eight hertz. And it's on the border of two of our brain. We have five different brainwave frequencies, gamma, which is ultra high functioning, beta activities of daily living to the awake state, um, alpha, when you begin to meditate, relax, daydream, start to drift off into sleep, theta, which is dreaming, restful sleep, and then delta, which is very low brainwave activity, but it's important because that's when you fight infections and you heal. But on the alpha theta border, um, around eight hertz is conducive to spiritual, uh, psychic, and mediumistic activity. Spirits are able to see that. They align their frequency. They bring their vibrational frequency down to the eight hertz level. They get connection, and that's why they step into dreams. I'm so glad you talked about the beautiful garden with the flowers. Oftentimes, what they do is they will create a point of reference. For you, it's a beautiful garden. The English gardens with the twisting, you know, um, um, you know, walkways. Sometimes it'll be maybe a, a room with tables in it. Um, maybe it's a cafe somewhere. It could be different things it, because that's not really where they are or what they're doing. Because once again, they're moving around at the speed of light and, and uh, they're immortal living beings, but they're creating a point of reference that you and I can understand and relate to. And so they will have uh, discussions uh, with us there. And you know the difference between a dream and a visitation, I mean, a, a, a dream and a visitation. A dream has all that surrealistic quality to it that all of a sudden a pumpkin turns into a bat and flies around or whatever, you know. But a, a visitation feels real. It's a coherent conversation. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. It doesn't have to be real long. It can be a few moments, but as long as you get that coherent message, and then when you come out of it, you're convinced, oh my gosh, I just had a conversation with my mom. So that is why spirits choose choose dreams. And this has been documented for thousands of years in several religions. Um, it's interesting how uh, evangelical uh, religious fanatics are all about, oh, this is all evil, evil, evil. But then the Bible, Scripture, both Old and New Testament, is filled with people who've had contact with spiritual entities and dreams. One of my favorite um, stories and one of the most studied passages in Scripture is Jacob's Ladder in the Old Testament. And Jacob lays down and he's sleeping and all of a sudden he sees this ladder that goes into heaven and angels are running up and down the ladder, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And this has been one of the most studied passages, not just by Hebrew and Christian scholars, but by Buddhists, um, Hindus, Islamic scholars. It is believed that this was some type of visitation. This was the divine communicating with him. And it is one possible reference to reincarnation, that the angels coming down the ladder to earth symbolize okay, we're a soul, we come to earth, and then they go back up. It also symbolizes uh, the rise and fall of civilizations throughout history. Um, it could be a reference to near-death experiences. So it's really a fascinating, fascinating passage. And there, there's uh, you know other interpretations um, connected to it. That's just one that, that I'm bringing up. So dreams have been documented for thousands of years as one of the most common forms of spirit communication with, with humans. Yes, and and those two dreams, which I they were many years ago, but I still remember them as as if I had them last night. They were so vivid, and perhaps with my grandfather, maybe it it was not surprising, but with the Pope, maybe there was some connection. Maybe he wanted to to convey something to me. <laughs> Certainly, well, I mean, you know, the Catholic Church has declared Pope John Paul II a saint. Or at least he's, you know, he's he's on that. Um, 
he was a very good man. I didn't agree with a lot of, you know, his, uh, some of the things that, that he stood for. I thought he was too strict and too traditional, but, but be that as it may, but, um, that would make sense because in interfacing with the divine, um, you would be more apt to be able to relate to and talk to Pope John Paul II than if Krishna mm. came through. Okay, so if you had a Hindu deity that was blue and had six arms and was dancing around, for people <laughs> that are Hindus, it'd be like, oh, you know, Krishna. But for people who aren't, you know, and it's not not that that either Krishna or uh, Pope John Paul um, are trying to deceive or or to harm you, but that would be an, an entity that you would be able to, to relate to. Mm. But what do you think, because when I woke up from those both dreams, I was a bit cranky that I didn't remember what the conversation was about, or, well, it wasn't really conversation because they were just speaking to me and I was listening, that I didn't consciously re remember that. What do you think is the reason when we do receive presumably important messages and insights in our sleep visitations, why don't we remember them at the conscious level when we wake up? Well, well I just wrote an article which is in the um, August um, um, edition of Best Holistic Life magazine. So everyone can go to bestholisticlife.com. You can get an online version and the title of the article is Navigating the World of Dreams. Okay. And there's a technique that I've introduced because a lot of people say, I don't remember my dream or this one dream and Pope John Paul was there. And um, I put it in the context, uh, if you indulge me for a minute, my whole life I had this reoccurring dream where I, I was trying to run, but I couldn't really move and rain was pelting me. And and I was I was running across this giant field, and then all of a sudden I saw this tree with a tree house, and a bolt of lightning hit it and destroyed it. And I ran in the opposite direction, and I came up to this frightening, terrifying, cavernous place. And I didn't want to go in, but another bolt of lightning cracked the sky above me. So I entered it, and I realized it was the gate to hell. And and there was all these robotic creatures in there with these blue cathode ray tube brains, and they were staring at me with emotionless eyes. And there was something lurking in the bowels of the cave, and it was it was some type of creature coming. And I had to hide under this table, and all of a sudden I'd wake up in a cold sweat. And and, and this this dream um, repeated my whole life. And I learned a meditation technique from one of my mentors, the Reverend Pat Romando, who, who has left us back in 2012. And Pat, I know you're listening and I love you. Um, and, and she taught me to what you do is you sit down and you breathe in through your, your nose and then exhale through your mouth a couple times. And you envision breathing through your nose, you inhaling the white light and exhaling out of your mouth, think of everything that's making you tense as a cloud, a dark cloud. So it's in white light, then black cloud, then in white light, gray cloud, because the more you do it, then it, then uh, you, to get white light in, white light back, and then count backwards from 10. Okay, I'm going deeper, nine, deeper still, eight, relax and go all the way to one, and then summon the dream, what you remember of it, because now you're navigating the world of dreams, you're in the meditative state, you call forth the dream, and now you're able to take it to its logical conclusion. So when I did that, all of a sudden, there I found myself in the gate of hell. And this thing was in there. And instead of trying to run away, I said, well, let me find out what's in here. So I went into the gate of hell and I noticed a distinct lack of demons. And then I felt myself moving quicker and quicker, like going through this complex subterranean network of tunnels. And I was going faster and faster and faster. And I could smell the, the wet earth and I could see the wooden beams. And then all of a sudden I headed straight up and this trap door flipped open and I sprang out onto a beautiful green field of grass in bright sunlight. And then it all came back to me. 
when I was a toddler, I was about two years old, I wandered away from my family's house and it was during the summer and all of a sudden it started a thunder and lightning and my parents didn't know where I were, was and they were frantically looking for me and a neighborhood um, um, tree house got hit by lightning and exploded and I got scared and I hid in this neighbor's garage and he was this cranky old guy that was a ham radio operator and he had all this radio equipment in his garage and it got turned into these evil robotic creatures and when I heard him coming toward the garage, I hid under this table. And over the years, the psyche, my psyche turned it into it was the gate of hell. But then when I confronted the dream and went into the gate of hell in this complex underground network of tunnels, it revealed to me in the meditation that I was delving into my deepest fears, my own psyche, and that uh, when I confronted it and the trap door opened and I popped out on the bright green field of grass, then I remembered that the rainstorm stopped. I ran outside and my mother, father, brother, and sister saw me and they hugged me and kissed me and loved me. So this nightmare actually turned into a beautiful memory. And so this is a technique that everybody can use, not just for confronting nightmares, but for those dreams that perplex us. So that's what I would recommend. If you have a dream where it feels like you spoke to a deceased loved one, well, do that technique. Get my article because it'll lead you through it. Bestholisticlife.com, August edition. And you can go through that and then you will be able to summon the dream. Now, you may not be summoning the spirit back, but it will help you recreate the dream and you will start remembering more and more parts to it. So that would be my recommendation, how to deal with that particular situation. Very interesting. And thank you so much for sharing. So I gather that that nightmare dream has stopped. Oh, yes. I've never had it since. Uh, <laughs> when, once I went through that. <laughs> and and also that that's very basic uh, psychology is when you confront fears, um, that's how you get rid of them mm. because then it no longer has any control over you. Because that was that was a terrifying dream. I mean, I'm at the gate of hell, and then I wake up and sopping wet, you know, scared to death because I was I was just two years old and I was I was scared to death. And and that's also a technique for for a confronting a recurring nightmare, but it's also for confronting or rather trying to understand complex dreams. Mm, absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing. So we can all read about it in your article. Mark, what do you think about the future of our spirit communication? Do you think that one day it will be like FaceTime on our phones where we will be able to see or at least perceive or hear or otherwise perceive spirit communication more openly and more vividly. What what are your thoughts on that? I think it's just a matter of time uh, before such a device hit um, is released. And I know that one is in the works. Um, I recently worked with Gary Galka um, on the Discovery Channel show, and he developed what's known as the Spirit Box, which scans uh, EM frequencies, those those uh, uh, hertz frequencies, and will pick up on voices with spirits. And you can actually get a sentence and, and you can even interact to some extent. Um, it's a lot quicker when I do it as a medium and I get more complete information because, <laughs> well, you know, because that's why they had me there. He was the technology technology and I'm on I'm the biotechnology. Yeah. But um, Dr. Gary Schwartz from the LACH, Laboratory Advanced Consciousness and Health at the University of Arizona, is working with a team of geniuses like himself on the Soul Phone. And the Soul Phone project is exactly what you're describing, a device that essentially it'll be live from the other side. It's your family. You know, I mean, it's, and I'm making a joke there, but, but, um, but the thing is, we now have the benefit of 21st century science and quantum physics and advanced electrical engineering. Spirit communication yeah. isn't negative or hocus pocus. The people who wallow in Bronze Age and Iron Age fear and fantasy, and oh, it's against God and blah, 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 blah. It's like, look, if you want to wallow in uh, the tar pit of fear, have at it. However, for the rest of us, 
Um, the afterlife is real. Mm -hmm. Spirit communication is real. And it's all based on quantum physics. This does not negate the spirituality or the connection to God. I mean, God is part of or is mm -hmm. this energy. And now we have the technology and are developing it to where we'll be able to tune into the afterlife frequency and actually talk to spirits. So it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> Good. And, uh, I think Can't that, wait. <laughs> yeah, I think we, we live in an exciting era. And, and until then, it's mediums like myself who are are uh, the soul phone. And because and, and when selecting a medium, uh, you know, research his or her background, website, um, if you get a referral from from somebody, you know, who has has been to a medium, word of mouth is always, always uh, really good. Um, I do readings for people all over the world. I've been tested by scientists uh, in the United States and in the UK. Uh, so, so, you know, I'm, I am a legitimate medium and there are several out there, but and then there are the frauds. So you got to be watch out yeah. for them too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And just very quickly, thank you for that. And just very quickly, that spirit box that you've mentioned, is it the one that uh, that you talk about in your book, in one of the stories in your book? It is. T towards the end, that, that's the one. Yeah, yeah when and, you, it, and yeah. it was really great because um, when, I, when I went to the shoot for the Discovery Channel, um, you know, I, I'd heard about Gary Golf and I was talking to him and I said, wait a second you invented the spirit box. He goes, yes. And I said, well, um, did you have it around? I gave him the year. He goes, yeah, that was one of the earlier versions. It's much more sophisticated now. And then, and then he, he set one up and we started, you know, um, working with it. And it was cool because um, I heard a couple of uh, familiar voices, including my mother, my father, my friend, father, Sonny, my aunt, Betty, um, my grandmother uh, came through and his daughter. And then what was really cool is his daughter's voice came through. That's why he he uh, developed this, because his beautiful teenage daughter unfortunately died. Then all of a sudden, I started getting messages from her as well. And I remember I, I said a couple things, and, and he just burst into tears. He said, nobody knows that. You know, So it was very fascinating to have both myself as a medium and the technology there, and the spirits were working through both. Yes. Oh, beautiful. How beautiful. Yes, we are certainly living in very exciting times and with the progress and developments in technology, we are coming closer and closer to thinning the veil between the dimensions and between our 3D reality and the afterlife, which I feel is of of benefit to both, to everyone involved, all the parties involved, because as you said so beautifully, it is the it is love and it is the connection that we all have as souls and spirits to, I guess, in the end of the day, to make our experience better, more profound, more meaningful, beyond and above of what most people see as life being just a struggle and with all the horrors and 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 bad things and horrible things going on. So that love and inspiration is something that we definitely need much more of. Well, Mark, thank you so much for another beautiful conversation on quantum living. It's been a pleasure, as always, to have you back on my show. Thank you so much. And to everybody listening, namaste, God bless, be at peace. Thank you so much. That's all for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you really loved it, please post a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify to encourage others to listen to it. For the show notes, guest and podcast info, reviews, comments, and much more, please visit quantumlivingpodcast.com. And if you'd like to dive deeper into quantum living and explore how you could work with me, please contact me and I'd be delighted to help and support you on your quantum journey. I am your host, Anna Anderson. I look forward to connecting with you in the next episode of Quantum Living. Until then, keep your vibrations high and be well.